Okay, it is uh, seven o'clock p.m. on the West Coast. Um, thank you all for for joining. I imagine a few more people may filter in. Uh, we're trying something different this time. Uh, as always, we're experimenting with the best ways to reach out and chat with our members. Um, Lori may look a little like uh, she's been on the screen today. Um, and yes, we did one two hours ago um, or three hours ago. I'm not sure. Uh, three hours ago to accommodate right. yeah. more of our West Coast, East Coast people. And we're doing a second one this time. We'll go through the same things. But um, as with all these things, it's a little bit different. Well, let me start with introductions first. Uh, I think I know most of you probably, or you may know of me. I'm Eric McHenry, uh, your uh, international president. I'm out here in sunny California. Um, below me on my screen is Lori Plummer. She's our corporate manager Hi. out there from Jackson Center, Ohio. And off to the left is uh, Christy Yanyan. Uh, Christy is our marketing manager, also sitting in Jackson Center, um, Ohio. Um, Lori and uh, Christy are two of our five and a half or so uh, staff members that are employed by our club um, that do a frankly remarkable job of supporting us 18,000 members. It's really quite a leverage of that few staff to 18,000 members. And so thank you too for staying up late out there in Ohio. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's maybe more entertaining at this time of night, y'all, because I know I'm on the down <laughs> slide. Uh, you'll pick it up when you start talking about stuff. So the format for these, and by the way, this is, I think, uh, it almost marks about a year and a few days um, after the first time Lori and I did this. We did our first one of these actually live in Maine at the International Rally in Maine. And, and the goal was to find out more relaxed ways of communicating uh, with our members. Uh, we really enjoy it. Uh, we've done one a quarter. Uh, we've done two or three live ones. Uh, we did one in Wyoming, which was really fun. We were sitting under the uh, gazebo out there in a pavilion in Wyoming and had a nice discussion. So the format of these is that I, you, you can ask anything you want. And I tell everyone this is that I'm very comfortable answering any question um, or having any question asked. And uh, Lori and I will do our best to answer it um, unless it's something that's confidential, um, which very few things of those exist. Um, we, because of the number of people we typically have of these things, um, we ask that everyone use the chat function and or the Q&A function. And you'll be able to see your Q&A comments, everyone else's down there. Uh, we will get to all of the questions. Um, Christy Yadnan is gonna help us uh, sort of manage them. We'll group some of the answers together. We'll pause every once in a while and we'll stop and answer questions. Uh, we are gonna finish in one hour. Um, we're very respectful of your time, um, but you know we may stay around for a little bit longer if anyone has any additional questions. So usually I start off with a little bit of presentation, which I think I'm gonna do that anyway. Uh, Chris, I, Christopher, I see your question. I assume that's you, Christopher Cooper, um, but we'll get back to that in a second. I want to share a couple of updates. The first one, which you know gets me most excited, is that Lori and I just finished attending the uh, Airstream uh, International or the International Airstream Dealers um, Conference in Columbus, Ohio. And what's really interesting about this is that this is something that they do every year. Airstream Inc., which is the manufacturer, the factory does. Uh, it's led by their CEO, Bob Wheeler, and their uh, sales manager, Justin Humphreys, and their marketing um, chief marketing officer, sorry, VP of sales, Justin Humphrey, and the chief marketing officer, Molly Hansen. Um, this is the first time our club has been invited to participate in a meaningful fashion. And so we got to spend a lot of time talking to the Airstream staff, but more importantly, we spent a lot of time meeting and talking to the dealers. And I'll well, you'll see this thread through what Lori and I talk about tonight. Um, one of the things we were really pleased to learn is how Airstream views um, their business. So, so for a lot of things, if, if you buy a dishwasher or if you buy a, um, a bow or something, it's sort of a single purchase that the manufacturers hope you're happy with, but really the interaction ends once you buy it. Um, Airstream views it differently. Airstream views that these things that they sell, these trailers and, and, and uh, touring coaches are really part of a extended life cycle. And I remember Bob Wheeler said this about a year ago, the CEO, he said that one of their goals is that when anyone buys an Airstream, they fall in love with the Airstream. 
And they always will stick with that brand and keep buying Airstreams over and over again. Now, now this makes sense from their perspective. But what's really interesting now and how they think about it is that they spend about half of their time at this dealer's meeting where all the um, general managers and owners of the dealerships were there um, from all over the world, by the way. We talked to people from dealer owners from uh, Germany, from um, from um, Japan. Japan, yeah, from Taiwan, from South Korea, you know, from the UK. It was really quite interesting. So with, with they, they spent about half of their time on service because even though I know when I speak to the members, and I have an Airstream too, of course, the Vernon and I do, some of the concerns are on service. Airstream is really, really concerned and interested in keeping their eye on the service ball because they understand that once you leave the lot, once we leave the lot with our Airstreams, if we have service problems, then that is um, a negative experience. Um, and it may dissuade people from staying with the brand. It certainly won't make them happy about the brand experience. The novel part also though, is that they have now even more started to view our club as a critical part of that experience. And I think we understand why already, right? Cause you know, we, we go to rallies, we have events, it's a little bit of our community and it, it extends the pleasure of this silver thing that we, tow behind our trailers or drive in. Airstream Inc. is starting to view us now as a critical part of that continuum of, of, of customers, customer experience. So let me talk a little bit about what I shared with them because um, I turned out I was, ended up being, we ended up being one, one of the four major speakers there to the dealers, which was uh, quite exciting. But I wanna share with them, with you all, what I, what I talked about with them. Okay, so I believe I'm sharing now. You are. Right. You go. <laughs> okay. And so again, we were asked by Airstream to, to give this presentation. And so as you can see, it was hosted by Airstream, the annual meeting. There's about 300 attendees, probably about 200 dealers, um, dealer owners there. Um, we were one of the, uh, the keynote presentations. One of the fantastic comments, though, that um, one of their speakers gave was right below on the left side, a gentleman, Don Pepper. And uh, he spoke for about a half hour on this a continuum of consumer experience. And he said, customer experience can be defined by the totality of a customer's interaction over time uh, with the brand over time, right? Kind of makes sense, right? You know, this experience is not just leaving the sales floor. It's, it's when you go back for service, when you take it out on a trip, the people you meet. And that, we know, that's that experience. And so from our perspective, this is my comments in blue, was that our club, um, we are an invaluable part of that experience, um, and we are their partners, and they really are starting to, to, to view us this way. So, um, anyway, it was a stage and presented. It was, it was kind of fun. <laughs> Here's what I talked about. Um, I talked about sort of how we view our club, right? Um, you know, be it your first adventure. I know someone's on this. I can't remember your guys' names that just joined, you know, or your hundredth. You know, being a part of our club. Um, it really means a neighbor is never too far away to lend a hand, share an experience, or shoot the breeze. And I was talking to an Airstream friend of ours um, just recently up in Washington State, and she was a sharing a story with me where she broke down on the side of the road, I think coming back from international. And guess what? She's sitting there, and some other person in an Airstream, one of our club members, pulls up behind her and says, hey, can I help you? Right? That is a cool thing. Right. And we all have kind of experienced that as we've gone through personal hardships or personal joys, or just hanging out with people that, that, that this is our community and we do really rally together. Um, our promise, though, is that we are a diverse and welcoming group of Airstream owners and, you know, just come have fun time with us, hang out and just sort of forget about the outside world. Um, we're kind of all in this together. This next slide was really important for us to talk about. And, um, We've known for a long time from talking with Airstream Inc. that, you know, they're they're 91 years old, Airstream Inc. is, and they want to be in business for another 91 years. And they look at the demographics of people buying Airstreams now. I would say the younger people, <laughs> you know, I'm 65, so I guess I'm in the older older side. But they look at the demographics of people who are buying their first Airstream or on their second and they, they have to sell and they want to sell to this demographic because if they don't sell to that demographic successfully, they're not going to be around for another 90 years. We're the same way as a club. And we pulled this presentation together. Some of you may recognize it's from Maine. 
sorry, yes, from International Rally in Maine last year. And it was just a hoot. And I think that those of you that were there um, and those of you who are in Wyoming, you understand that we are very diverse group. And that means age, it means gender, it means anything else. And in fact, in the picture on the second from the right, some of you probably recognize, I think that's Jay Thompson there, right, Lori? Right? Yes. And, yep. you know, he's probably on the older side. And then there's James Shaw there on the left side, and he's on the younger side, right? So this is an excellent picture of how we all come together um, as a group and just have a blast. Is Actually, really Jay's on this call. Then I see Jay and Elna listed on this maybe call. Yeah, but it's a really good picture that you know this is us. Uh, we are a very wide group of people, um, and we're really excited about it. I talked about our intra clubs because. Airstream Inc. also understands that not everyone has a 30-foot classic like Laverne and I do. They may have a base camp and they want to go up in the Sierras and go down those BLM dirt roads where you're not sure if you can turn around or not. Um, they want to maybe they want to go boondocking. You know, maybe they are single female towers, or maybe they're just single towers, right? Um, maybe they're LGBTQ plus, you know, and more recently we just formed a club. Well, we didn't form it. Mark and his group did a Mark Kruer called Grapes and Grains Intra Club. Um, it is, I think it's the fastest growing intra club um, that we've ever had. Um, it's probably the largest now or second to back. And they put on a really great show in Wyoming, just a really a fun time. No one's getting drunk. They're just having a fun time. We also just launched an intra club for base camp owners. And some of you may know this, that uh, base camp is the number one selling trailer that Airstream sells. And it's not just because of the lower cost, although I'm sure that has something to do with it. The, the, the people that often buy base camps, they want something smaller. Maybe they're going off road. Maybe they want to throw their mountain bikes in the back or their kayaks in the back or just their hiking boots in the back. They're, but they want to go down those roads that a lot of people don't go down. Um, and so we want to make sure that there's room for people that love to do with base camps. And so we just formed a base camp group. Um, thank you, Millie O'Donnell, for getting that going. Um, and other people in the club as well. Uh, they're having their first rally. I think it's in Colorado and it's going to be a blast. I, a lot of you know I want a base camp also. I want to tow it with a Rivian truck, but that's a separate thing. Um, but anyway, so we're trying to be inclusive. We want to provide a place for everyone to come together. <laughs> Lori laughs because I'm, I've, I've been trying to do a GoFundMe for a uh, base camp REI 20X, <laughs> by the way, and a Rivian truck for a while now. But, but the cool thing we also talk about is the fact that, you know, for those people that um, are in our club, us, we have actually more than 800 events across the U.S., caravans, weekend events, special interest events, national rallies, et cetera. The part I pointed out to the dealers, though, um, in Columbus was that, and I love these three pictures. These are from a variety of, of uh, rallies, probably in Maine. It could be at the Region 12 rally. It's not where some of our members um, help put on seminars and clinics. This is a couple of pictures of, of um, I think Mike showing how to do a backup class in Maine to a whole bunch of people and someone showing how to change a tire. Uh, we did that in our region 12 rally. It was done in some international rallies as well. And these are some of the fun things that people really wanna do. So we provide a lot of opportunities. Um, I also wanted to talk about our heritage because we are not a brand were it not for Wally Byam. You know, Wally Byam started our group um, these iconic vintage trailers are a core part of our group. If you ever go to one of our international rallies, you'll see a caravan, a, a parade of the vintage trailers. Um, they're just amazing. They're a really good part of our history and our presence. And so we wanted to make sure the dealers understood that it's not just the ones that come off the factory that really make our club, but the legacies and the um, vintage ones as well. But then, okay, so, but if you ever talk to a bunch of salespeople, you, you understand, they'll be like, oh, that's nice. What does this mean to me, right? They're kind of focused on the sale and the support. And, and this is what I shared with them, is that really, this is how we help out. And they all kind of were nodding their heads, right? I told them, look, you know, all of you have had the experience where someone comes in and buys an Airstream. You give them a one hour or three hour course on how to use it, how to hitch it up. They roll off the lot. And then they get these phone calls. Wait a minute, I don't really remember how to do that weight distribution hitch. Or like Laverne and me, we have a classic Airstream. We got it recently. We've had three Airstreams, 13 years. We could not figure out how that Aldi heating system worked. 
even after they talk to us, all these buttons, right? So there is room and a role for our club to help people like that, like us, because we obviously talked to our friends and got some tips on, oh, this is what you do. This is how you purge the water. This is when you purge the water, things like that. The other key thing that we provide and Airstream really loved, I want you all to remember these things, is that we provide a lot of turnkey opportunities of vacation in the, in the Airstreams. A lot of people will buy them and you know, it's hard to get a reservation at a state park or a national park or even at a KOA sometimes. They just don't use them. But guess what? We have 800 rallies. We get people out there using them. We have a trusted knowledge base, all y'all out there. Um, I think probably half the people on this call I know, and I've asked them probably help on something over my 13 years of having an Airstream. But, but this community is a big thing. So we, we were there also to launch this new program. Laura's gonna tell a little bit more about it in a second. It's called the Airstream Explorer Program. And this is the one that uh, we signed at the International Board of Trust Trustees meeting with Bob Wheeler in May, where it was a historic agreement. You know, For every Airstream coming off the factory line, Airstream is offering and paying for a one-year membership in our club. It's a huge deal. It's a really huge deal. And that really shows how important they believe uh, we are to that customer experience. So I think that's it for my slides. Um, I want Lori kind of talk about the Airstream Explorer membership, kind of the status of it, when you'll start hearing about it more. It won't affect pretty much everyone on this call because you're already members, but I want you to understand it. All right, over to you, Lori. All righty, so the Explorer membership uh, program with Airstream Inc. launched on July 1st. So basically what is happening is that when somebody purchases an Airstream, as Eric mentioned, Airstream Inc. is supporting um, them to have a membership. So they come through us with a special code to be able to get that to happen. Um, as we were at the dealers meeting, the, the dealers are just now really learning about it. They don't have any like distribution material or marketing material in, relate, in relation to this program, but Airstream Inc. and we are working on that to get that out to the dealers uh, to make sure everybody's aware of it to, and take advantage of it. So they'll cycle into the through the club. And then we have a, um, again, this is past my bedtime. So I'm sorry if I drag a little bit on speaking, but I'm doing the best I can, right? So um, so we will initially reach out to them from HQ. They'll we'll send in their welcome packet, a welcome email. And then Barb Darian, our, the chair of our international um, membership committee, she has a team that will also be working with these people. Again, our goal is to get them in that Airstream get them to an event, have them fall in love with, with our community, with the Airstream, so they will remain an Airstream owner as well as a club member. So that's the overall goal. Um, in the last uh, month, we've had actually more than what we thought after a meeting I had today, close to 50 um, sign up with this program. And then so we expect a lot more coming down the road. So we're super excited about it. So, Lori, for some folks, they may not know how many new members we get a week. It's phenomenal. Just so, that. Yeah. So, um, actually, I've been with the club since 2014. And when I came, we were getting 23 to 25 a week. Now we're between probably 46 and 50 a week is what we're getting. And so we expect with this to probably bump us up another notch between the 60 and 70 mark. At least that is our, our hope is we get... Um, get the information out to the new owners. Yeah, thanks. I have to always tell people that our goal as a club is not to necessarily grow. We want to be vital. We want to, you know, be relevant, but we really have to provide that benefit, right? Because if, if we're getting 100 new members a month and they're not getting any value out of it, we're going to lose them. So although we love the growth, it's great. Um, there's a whole bunch of focus on, as Lori said, how to get our new members involved in our club, to go out on, on rallies, on caravans. We understand that we have to help get more events out there. We'll talk some more about that a little bit later, um, about some thoughts about how do we open up new types of events, more events, get people involved to volunteer, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I thought just on that note, um, actually let's pause and take some questions. So I, I think this is Christopher Cooper um, asking about um, creating an ACI mountain bikers group. Yeah, for sure. So we have three types of groups or things, let me call them entities. We have a local club, which is geographically organized, like, you know, Chris, the Greater Bay Area Stream Club or 
San Diego Air Shoe Club or whatever. But we also have intra clubs. And those are kind of smaller clubs that are kind of more vertical, if you will. Stella Sisters, Boondockers, VAC, things like that, Vintage, things like that. And those are particularly aligned with large interest, um, single woman towers, things like that. We also just launched something that's a little bit lighter and they're called interest groups. Apologize for all the names, but that's what we're calling them. And those are ones that don't really need a structure. They don't really need officers. They don't need constitution and bylaws. They just want to get together and go boondocking. They want to get together. There's a kayaking interest group, interest group that just formed. The base camp interest group just formed. Just kind of a loose connection of people. Um, we're looking for that. And so, Christopher, if you have any ideas, um, um, maybe just shoot it to me. We can talk about how to do that. Uh, there's been some interest in in having some. Um, I hesitate to say this for pickleball, and that's a huge thing, but that's a classic interest group, right? People who want to get together and do some more um, things like that. Um, so yeah, uh, get back to me on that. I can help you get that going. It has to has to go to the board. It's a pretty easy thing to do. We have to find a leader, but yeah, it's really interesting. Um, let's see. So I see Kat um, posted a question about the printed directory. Um, so the 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 actually tomorrow we have an IBT meeting that will finalize some of the the thoughts and and structure behind um, the printed directory. So through the member portal and everybody can access the the digital directory. And um, so with courtesy parking, we do have that on on our website. And I'm sure you're familiar with the map, but I see your point of trying to have that organized just by state. So um, once we know, finalize what's in the printed directory, so I call it the printed directory. It's not going to be the printed directory. Maybe we should call it the annual directory. There will be a similar um, format that's going to be able to be downloaded from our website, uh, what you, instead of getting it printed. So we'll know more about that coming up, but we will keep that in mind, Kat, on keeping um, like it is in the in the directory uh, group by states. Yeah. So I want to share a little bit about courtesy parking since it's on the table right now. Um, Eric's not going to ask me to do a 10 o'clock gig for me anymore, you, is he? <laughs> you see? She's like, nope, cut so her off. You're doing great. So um, this is only available to our members. And one of the things the board talked about when we were together for our strategy session in Jackson Center last May was that this is one of the benefits that a lot of our club members do not know about. And when we talk about having this many members come into our club and wanting to provide unique Airstream opportunities or experiences for them, this is one of them. So a lot of y'all probably know about um, Harvest Host. This is a Harvest Host, but for our members only. So if, if you go to current members on the website here and you go to courtesy parking, you have to be logged in. I, I am already, see my name up here. The idea is that if you're traveling across country um, and you just want to stay somewhere for a night, we have about 800 of our members who have graciously offered their homes for this. And so, for example, let's say I was I was going to be in, I don't know, I go to the West Coast, actually. They're, they're kind of there tonight, right? Um, let's say I was in Colorado. Eh, I'm going to go over here to Utah. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to be coming across on 80. I'd love to stay just sort of um, south of here. I don't really want to go to the KOA over there. Um, and I'm to see who's there. And it turns in as, as if I scroll in. Whoa, down to their address. There's a pin, click on the pin. And you know, this is Kevin Bueller, um, Salt Lake City. And uh, I would phone or I would email Kevin and say, hey, look, dude, I'm coming through your area two days from now. I got a 30 foot Airstream. Do you have room? And Kevin would say yes or no, right? And I'd be able to stay there. Um, it's it's uh, it's free. There's no expectation of payment or purchase of goods and services. It's just something our members want to do. They love doing it. I guarantee you everyone who's on this map wants people to come by. I also guarantee you most people on this map say hardly anyone ever does come by. Um, a lot of members don't know about this. And so uh, you just show up. But one of the things that we heard a lot about um, at our strategy meeting last year was that we'd love to make this experience a little bit easier. For those of you who have used Harvest Host, you may get a sense of what I mean. Um, in Harvest Host, I would say, 
me look, I'm going between Nevada and Salt Lake City and Park City. Just show me the Harvest Host locations within 20 miles of my route on Highway 80. And it would just show those. And when you clicked on that area, it would show the attributes about that property. It would say that, you know, they're not there from January through February. Um, they can take a 20-foot trailer. Um, and you would click on send a request to stay there electronically. It would come back in a day and say yes or no, right? We, we want to make the experience our courtesy parking a similar one. And so we're working pretty hard to make that happen. I can't go into details, but if we stay on schedule, we'll start talking about it in the January timeframe and hopefully launch it in the uh, early part of the summer um, or late spring. That's courtesy parking. Laverne and I use it all the time. By the way, it's great. Um, you've seen some of it in my president's uh, corners. We've met some really wonderful people because um, we just stayed at their house and had a great time, you know, and they're always great. Uh, one couple we stayed at, they had young kids. And so, you know, they did their dinner thing. We did our dinner thing. And then we got together in the back porch after our dinners and had a glass of wine or sat and talked. And it's really, really fun. Um, and it's exclusive to our, our, um, our club. So, so Linda, the, so the question about courtesy parking, that wasn't Linda, it was someone else about courtesy parking. It's, it's just that, yeah, we can, put on, we can put it in a book, but there are some other attractive ways of making it usable. Um, filtering by state, filtering by near, near proximity to a route, things like that. Okay, other questions. Um, let's, Dave Rose has a question about insurance. That's always a good one. Uh, DNO, directors and officers insurance. Um, liability so, insurance for events. Go ahead. Yeah. So Dave, the way our insurance works for the club is any club event, any volunteer officer director that is working in capacity for the club, such as hosting a rally, organizing a rally, um, liability coverage, we, is, we do have a liability coverage for them. So I always use the analogy that if Bob and Joe are pulling in with their airstreams and they back into each other. That's not our gig. But if Peggy Sue puts out a crock pot and strings out a, a, you know, a power cord and it's a trip hazard, somebody trips and gets hurt, then that is when our insurance will, co co will um, come in to, to help Peggy as well as cover whoever uh, the liability of whoever strung that cord out. So that is how our um, liability insurance works. Uh, there is not any DNO insurance for the local clubs or interclubs. It is recommended due to localities that each individual club, if you're interested in having DNO insurance for your club, that you invest in that on your own, which I know some local clubs have done that, but that's mainly due to um, locations throughout the country. Thank you, Lori. And, and as she said before, DNO is directors and officers, it's common to nonprofits and um, Linda, let me answer that question. Uh, so Linda Riggs asked a question about uh, getting into rallies. So it's a, well, depending where you live, I don't know where you live. Um, it's a big, big challenge. Um, rallies fill up really quickly. And there's a couple of things happening with that. One is that I think everyone knows that the pandemic spawned a whole group of people who love to uh, go out in the outdoors. So RV parks, campgrounds are typically full very fast, very early. Historically, it used to be that we'd have a rally and we'd get 20 sites and we'd have 10 people, 15 rigs show up. Nowadays, even within our club, because as you probably know, Airstream has had record sales and our club growth has been record, they sell out really fast. And so the people that are planning the rallies have a challenge because they are trying to get access to a facility it's large enough. And a lot of RV parks, just they just won't do it. Um, they'll say, sorry, we'll give you 15 sites, we'll give you 20 sites, but that's it. One of the things that most local clubs do, most do, that are in this situation is they give priority to their members. And so what they will do is they will say, if you're a member or an affiliate of our club, you get maybe five days early sign up, you know? And so, but non-members, non-affiliates, they can sign up after that first five day wait period or you know delay. They sometimes fill up. I know here where we are in California, um, if we don't jump on it, when the email comes out from our club, um, it's probably gonna be filled up. 
Now, typically, as it gets closer, there may or may not be some cancellations. There may or may not be waitlist movement. But, but Linda, it's a real challenge. And, and that's why I've been really trying to encourage us to find other alternatives um, to get larger rallies, more rallies. This is going to come up with caravans also. It came up in the last call. The single thing, the single thing that's limiting our club's ability to put on more events is volunteers. It, it really is. Because if you've been at our club for more than two months, you know the problem is trying to get hosts to host these rallies. These are not paid people. And so, you know, um, that's the challenge. And so I know all the clubs are trying to find rally hosts because without the rally hosts, they can't do rallies. Now, some clubs are experimenting with what we call no host rallies or just camping rallies. Those are becoming more popular. And that's where the club will say, hey, look, we're gonna be at this state park between these days. This is in general where we're gonna be. Here's a link to sign up with the state park. You better get in there and sign up. And so that's on the members to do it, right? Because the, you know, it's you sort of the faster you sign up at a state park yourself, the faster you'll get in. So it is a challenge, it's a known issue. Um, and we're trying to figure out ways to do that. Um, but I got to tell you, if uh, pay attention to your email, if your club does that, when they say it's open for sign up, sign up right away. We have a very popular rally where we, we live. Um, and the sign up is uh, six months ahead of time. That's the maximum for the state park. It, it sold out within probably three days. So if you don't sign up those first two days, if you're on vacation, you forget about it, you don't get to go. Um, it, it's a challenge. Um, I just don't need, don't need a way around it. Other than for everyone else out there, everyone out there, think about volunteering with your local club. Think about hosting some rallies. Um, there's some interesting ideas that we're tossing around and trying to share with people. I had mentioned Harvest Host. And one of the cool things about Harvest Host is that they're starting to see clubs like ours reserve a harvest host property for a weekend for a rally. It's kind of outside the standard harvest host model, but you can imagine because harvest hosts are wineries, they're farms, they're distilleries, they're breweries, they're open to saying, yeah, we could take 20 people maybe or 15 people to go on that field out there. And that's another venue um, that is sometimes open. So a number of our clubs are starting to look at harvest host um, or just basic boondocking rallies in the middle of nowhere also, where you don't have to make a reservation. And the right. other thing we're trying to expose ourselves to is more, I'm going to say, just a, um, event centers, fairgrounds, things of that nature. So, because um, of course, in my role, I'm always looking for the big places. But as we talk to grounds across the country, we tell them that we do events from 20 trailers, 100 trailers, 300 trailers, 500 up to a thousand. So that is another thing we're trying to get more resources for, for our clubs to um, organize these events so that they don't have the wait list. But I do know out West, South and out West seems to be more difficult than it is here on the East coast and Midwest. Yeah. It's very, camping is very, very popular. Yes. The other thing that some clubs are thinking about, and it's a challenge also is to have some midweek rallies and most clubs don't want to do that because it, often exclude people who work. But that's another idea to have some mixture of midweek rallies as well, where it isn't as impacted. So I would say, talk to your local club. Um, if you don't know who that is, let me know. I can get you in touch with that person. Um, but that's kind of thought. And we're looking for any creative ideas. Okay, John has a question about short caravans. Yes, yes. So this came up at our strategy session also. And kind of like the first question, we know, we've known this for years now that we would like to put on some shorter caravans. And these are ones that are five to seven days. We kind of call them caravans for working people, but it's more than that. It's people who don't want to go out for two months. Um, the challenge there, guess what, is volunteers. Our caravans are led by our members and we only have a certain capacity for people who want to lead a caravan. So we're trying to get more of our members um, to sign up for caravan lead training because we have those classes internally. I can connect you with that, um, but that's what it's gonna take. Although we're also ex exploring more um, what we call third party caravans. I, someone asked me this last session, what does third party mean? Well, really it means some outside organization providing a fully turnkey caravan. There are groups that do that, um, that put on caravans for to go to Washington, D.C. and explore Washington, D.C. 
the capitals. They take you to an RV park, take a bus into town, you do all these capital tours like that. So we actually have started to talk to a couple of those places to see if that's a way to augment our internal caravans. Because I just don't think that we're ever going to be able to provide the number of caravans our members want. And that's not just short ones, that's long ones also. So it is a big issue for us. Um, we'll be talking about that at our next strategy meeting too, to see how far we've gotten on that. I got to tell you though, it's a, it's a bit of a change for our club. You know, um, I think a lot of our club members have been around for a long time will say, well, we've always done our own caravans. Yeah, well, we have, but we don't have the capacity to do them anymore. So we got to look at different ways of, of doing that now, of augmenting it. It's actually a little bit of a good problem to have. So we have so many that want to participate and we want to get them to participate. So I have to think outside the box. Okay, let's, let's, we'll come back to a couple questions in a bit. I'm going to shift over to um, uh, our international rallies. Those are our signature events, um, although we have a lot of the region rallies too. So Lori, maybe you can share a little bit about um, rally 2023. And I've got that slide presentation I can put up when you're ready. Okay, so 2023 was a smashing success. Everybody, it was just amazing the amount of people that we had there. So super proud of the team and, and pulling it all together. For those that have been around and those who or those who may not know that we kind of changed the structure a little bit uh, starting in Rock Springs. We have less formality, less business stuff and just more fun. And again, our goal is to connect people, get people out and talking to one another and learning about their Airstream and lifestyle. So it was a great week of seminars and different types of entertainment. And the other thing we did differently that uh, we got a lot of positive feedback on was uh, typically we have a rally meal. And if anybody who's ever planned an event, you know, it's a challenge to to serve good food and a variety of food for different needs for, you know, 2,500 people. So we partnered with the local chamber. Um, we have what they call chamber bucks, which, which is basically certificates. You could either eat from the food truck or go downtown or, or whatever you want to do. So huge success. And we hope to mirror that, what we did there in, in future rallies. So we did an exit survey. Um, we always do, and we always beg everybody, literally beg everybody to fill it out because we want to know the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, so one of the things um, we just want to know overall how well, let's see here, what we got going on. Oh, this is the exit survey. Is that what you wanted to see? Well, yeah. I don't know what the white line is there. I'm seeing just a white line. I know I'm sleepy, but wow, there we go. Yeah. So um so we just overall asked people to rate us. This is on, if you guys go to the member resources and in the International Board of Trustees tab, you'll see that this is in the deck for tomorrow's um, tomorrow's meeting. But the overall experience, we got rated an eight, which I was super excited about from 3,700 folks. Um, we also learned, can you just flip through this and I'll talk through this, Eric, if you don't mind? Yeah, I think I just did something. Let me try, let me... I was trying to do a full screen and it did not like it. Let me try it again. Okay. Okay. Um, there we go. So so we got uh, our average score was an eight, which again, I'm super thrilled with out of 10. Um, we asked how many times uh, we go returning to Sweetwater. So that was between four and six years. And then we also asked how many rallies you've attended, which we had a ton of first timers. We had actually, we had so many first timers this year. We ran out of ribbons for those that have been first timers. We had ribbons, you know, we asked them to tell us ahead of time. Um, so I, we don't know what happened, but we had probably close to a thousand. Uh, the age bracket was a was little higher than we expected uh, in this survey, but that's okay. We all still had a great time. Doesn't matter, right? We had a lot of kids. It's just that they're kids. We did. did. We, had, we had about 80 kids. I mean, I'm excited. We already got a... Um, 10 signed up for uh, York, uh, not York. It's not where we're Sedalia. going next year, Sedalia next year. So um, I'll talk about Sedalia here in a second. Um, so this was because how many days did you attend? Most people were there for the full time. Again, we're trying to change our programming. So every day is a full day for everybody. And then next slide. Oh. And then asked about our communications. Um, I'll member, just start some of these. Yeah. yeah, member services, the presentations, all that stuff. We ask those questions so we know we can we can work on getting better for the future. 
Um, Christy that's here on the call, she, she just, uh, she has a lot of experience in event planning. So she has been a great asset to our team of helping us work through these things as well as uh, there's a couple staff members, three staff members on the team. Plus we also have six uh, volunteer members that are on our rally committee team. So it's a great combination of folks about too. 400 volunteers at the rally. I think you told me. Is yeah, right? we had close 400 volunteers at the rally. Uh, so moving on to Sedalia, which we just started the sales August 1st, 25, I still can't get the date right, you guys. 23 days in, and we're to almost 700 registrations, which we can go up to 1,500, and I am confident we're going to get there. Uh, and actually, uh, the team will be there in October to finalize our um, planning. That's typically what we do one year out. We'll go finalize our planning, and actually, they're going to be ex expanding their camping facility. So once we know more, um, I'm going to target to make sure we do another sellout. So yeah, as I said, almost 700 uh, within the first 23 days. And out of those 700 rigs, I did peak and we still have, um, we have kids and adults and, and everybody excited to get to do it all over again next year in Sedalia. And one of the reasons why I don't want to spend an undue amount of time our international rallies, but I know when I first joined the club, it kind of felt like the international rallies were um, yeah, for the leadership, you know, really, you know, that has completely changed. If in fact that was ever the way it was, uh, we have no longer have any business meetings. Um, no one dresses up, um, except for the opening ceremony and a little bit at closing, which is small. Um, we just have a great time. It's just a really fun event. And as Lori said, I encourage so many people to go now because, uh, to have the chance to be around like in Wyoming, almost 1,300 airstreams from across the U.S. and Canada is really quite amazing, actually, and just a lot of great programs. We put a lot of time into making it fun. The one thing that we have learned, though, is that our members really, really prefer full hookups. You know, we sort of okay with 30 amps sometimes and maybe pump outs, but strongly, strongly prefer full hookups. The days are gone when our members were interested in just parking in a lot uh, with three amps of current um, and maybe digging an auger behind the trailer and dumping back there. Our members really want the comfort and that's just a reality. Um, we do offer boondocking at international rallies. Um, surprisingly, all the people that signed up for boondocking with except for two or three moved over to full hookups um, it, when given the opportunity. Absolutely. Um, I think part of it is just that you're at a place for seven or eight days or 10 days. You know, you want to shower. It's just nice having your, your trailer functioning like it's fully supposed to. I also want to follow up on the month of the rallies. You know, if you've been around the club a long time, you know that our international rallies used to be in around July. That was um, Wally Byam's birthday. Uh, nowadays, I think all of us understand, like right now it's 85 degrees and Northern California, and it's almost 8 o'clock p.m. That's not normal. Um, to try to do a big rally in July in almost every part of our country right now uh, would be a big challenge. It would be often very hot. And our club went through three years in a row of unseasonable hot rallies. And we decided for Wyoming, we picked a place that was at 6,200 feet. Um, and it was not known for being hot. And the weather was actually pretty good there. Um, for Sedalia, Missouri, uh, there's absolutely no way we'd go to Sedalia in the summer. Um, it would be horrible. So um, we're trying to look at alternatives. Now, there's no perfect answer because, as Lori said, we really want to have young adults and kids attend. And we understand that school starts in August um, for a lot of places, early September. And so by having a rally in October, it's a trade-off. Um, for us, which we're not happy about, but we have limited opportunities. Next year, we're doing it in August, um, year after in, in uh, York, Pennsylvania. Um, I think we may get back to Wyoming in 2027, and it'll probably be the June, July timeframe again, but we'll see how that goes. I see a number of questions. I'm not sure I understand those. I'm not sure they're, um, oh, I see it's relevant to a, doula, a dually. Um, Lori, did you talk about your work? I'm sorry, I don't think so, um, for 2025. 
Uh, no, I just referenced that will be in York in 2025. Okay. That's all I said. Sorry. And we try to move these across the country, as you can probably yeah. tell. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of the but goal. Too. It is the goal. But again, the challenge right now is just our size that, that I know everybody loves full hookups. Uh, but but to ask of, uh, to find facilities with that many full hookups is very hard. So, um, but we're looking, we're continually looking and opening up the window for us to camp is making a big difference too. So um, yeah, so we'll just keep on, keep on going, keep on making it. Okay, let's segue to the, um, the Blue Beret and the Blue Beret uh, Bulletin, the Blue Beret uh, blog. Uh, to kick it off, hopefully you all saw the Blue Beret. Um, it was redesigned uh, for the first for the first time in a while last month. Um, smiling Wally on it, which was great. Uh, it's a first step. And Laura, maybe talk the uh, people through kind of where we're going the next, starting on September 1st, actually. Yeah, so, so um, the board decided that we're going to uh, reduce our number of print publications but so to augment that we're going to launch a blue beret bulletin which is basically an electronic newsletter it's going to have a very similar feel maybe four to five um, point articles that's going to point to our blog so we're in this you know new age of communication and trying to make sure that we're being um, as nimble as we can and to get information out to everybody so you're going to see um, the bulletin on the months that we're not printing the blue beret and we're final actually the IB we have an IBT meeting tomorrow and all that a lot of that stuff's going to be finalized tomorrow so we'll get more information out to the members to know what to expect um, in the future when it comes to our um, information uh, that we are sending out so um, that will start September 1st and then we'll uh, we also have our blog out there which Eric can you share your screen on the blog so this is our, our blog, uh, which is basically a, uh, compiled a bunch of different resources, stories, and anything that has come to us from our members or what our members is asking us to do. So this can be, you can find this right off of the main page of the airstreamclub.org. And then we have it broken down, down into categories. We have the news, destinations, education, gear, history, all kinds of different things here. So. Um, in the future, when you see that bulletin come out and it has something that's going to live here forever. Um, the other thing that we're working on in the office is to find a better uh, magazine reader for the printed Blue Beret. So just not when it goes out um, digitally as well, instead of just being a PDF, you'll still have the option to download it as a PDF, but actually have one of those magazine readers. I think if anybody's done any kind of reading online. Um, you can see those type of readers out there. Uh, do you want to make any comments there, Eric, on the blog or the bulletin? I think you're muted. I lost you. Yeah, you're muted. There we go. I was trying to bring some examples of the blog. But by the way, the blog sounds like this, you know, techie thing. Uh, pretty much everyone does it. Airstream Inc. has one. Um, most catalogs have them. So, so for example, one thing we're doing, which is novel for our club, is that we're linking in content from other people. And I was uh, sharing earlier, like under the gear tab over here, uh, we have some really great stories from um, Air Gear. Uh, they're Airstream couples, uh, a couple that live out of uh, uh, Arizona. They sell stuff, really great curated stuff. And so they agree to allow us to reprint their information. So for example, there's a great article that... Uh, that Tothi wrote um, about 36 things every, every Airstreamer should carry, right? This is uh, Cheryl Toth over here. As Laurie may have mentioned, you know, we're highlighting the members. Th these are members, right? And just really great articles about that, about hoses and things that they bring. Um, I did a presentation international about Starlink and we linked the Starlink presentation up here. Uh, we have some really good stories, which are just absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I, I think uh, this one story was, was written um, by Diane and Jeff uh, just about their first year of air streaming. It's a really cool story, actually. Um, education topics in there, uh, just great cooking things. 
talk about big red numbers, you know. And one uh, of the things we're going to encourage our newsletter editors, Eric, you mentioned this last um, session, is that it is very easy to pull one of these stories from this site and put it on a, a local newsletter or or pull it over to um, a local microsite. And that's one thing we want to try to get better on is sharing our content with the local clubs and vice versa. Right. You know, I used to be newsletter editor for Greater Bay Area, and it was always a challenge to find relevant and new content every month. And what's interesting, as Lori said, is that, you know, for example, if you want to publish something on Bitter Red Numbers, you go to this article, you would copy the URL. And since pretty much all club newsletters are digital anyway, um, PDFs, you just paste this in and say, hey, learn about Big Red Numbers. They click on the link and it takes them to this article. You know, so we're trying to provide these snippets also for social media too. you just clip that link, uh, copy that link, paste it into Facebook or whatever, and uh, it'll bring up the article. So it's a nice way to have portable, they call it durable content. Dawn is asking about uh, the number of printed Blue Berets. So we're going to go to quarterly four times a year, and we'll be publishing. We're not going to stay on the January, the, the standard quarters. Of course not. We can't do that. So, But we'll be publishing the months that um, is coming out very soon. So we'll make everybody aware of that. And in fact, if you go to the blog, it talks about it here. Club communication material changes. This just came out. Um, it talks about uh, what we're doing, the website project, the Blueberry Magazine. Um, Don, to your question at the bottom, here's the schedule for publications. The magazine is August, November, February, and May, and the bulletin and things like that. So you can actually cut this, copy it, and paste this into your your um, your URL. And, and these guys have a really great uh, newsletter at uh, Don's group. Andy, no, you do not need permission. Um, anything that's on our blog. It, can can be shared with the clubs, local clubs. No issues there. Absolutely help yourself. Something else we're thinking about doing also, and I, this happened with me, and I, I thought it was really interesting. I, I've been interviewed for some outside magazines, and often they will assign a writer, and they'll say, hey, Eric, you know, I, I want to write an article about airstreaming and stargazing. And someone called me, and they just interviewed me for an hour. They did a draft article, made some changes, and did it. So, Lori, maybe talk about Corey, your Corey there, and kind of our thoughts about potentially uh, doing some interviewing for, for articles from some of our members. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, um, Corey, so Corey Maxwell is our new, I shouldn't say new, he's been in with us almost a year, but he's the he's the young kid on the block at the office. Uh, so he is our new Blueberry editor, as well as he's a, a journalist by trade. So, um we are working with him as Christy at uh, one of Christy's roles as well at the office is our communications manager. So we're going to, we've talked about, we have members that have such amazing stories of a, whether they're second generation or third generation in their airstreaming life. And so we want to start working on capturing that. And so our thought process is, you know, it's not easy for anybody to, for not, not easy for folks to sit down and write a story about themselves. So we're going to have Corey reach out or Christy, or together we'll be reaching out to some of our members and actually um, interviewing them and let's learn about their their journey here in, in the Airstream Club or, or the lifestyle of the Airstream. So we're really excited about that because I know one of the things I keep keep wanting to do is is a story on, I'm, I've been with the club, actually it'll be nine years Friday and it's amazing still how many people I hear that's a second or third generation Airstream Club member and or Airstream owner. So that's a little thing I would love to learn more about and expose that story. I think people would just be fascinated um, how generational Airstreaming is. It's amazing. I told people this in the last session. I was up in Washington for the Potlatch reunion and I fell in love with this lady, Darlene. Um, she, uh, my, my new buddy now, she's my moonshine drinking buddy. I don't know how old she is. I won't hazard a guess, but I, I didn't realize this. It turned out a long time ago um, in our club, Airstream, the company put on these big international caravans, the ones you see in the pictures and stuff. They weren't done by club members. They were done by Airstream, the company. And this lady, Darlene, uh, she has big red number 29. I was like, how did she get 29? I mean, a two-digit number is rare to see. And it's is if you were an Airstream employee, she says, well, yeah, she was a director of caravans for Airstream Inc. 
back in our club history. And she's personally led and planned 20 something odd caravans. In fact, in the, the current Blue Beret, there's a picture of her in the lower right hand corner with her husband on the Panama caravan. And so, she, oh my gosh, the story she told me, um, the places she's been and with our club, she traveled with Wally, you know, it was just, just fascinating, right? So she, she agreed over after a couple of shots of moonshine to, to be interviewed for a story. So um, <laughs> I'm going to hold her to well, that. Yeah, we'll I hope someone's going to tell her right? about it. But, uh, but yeah, that's sort of something we want to have in our thing. Okay, so just to so, time check, um, I- I want to ask- Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can I answer? Julie had a question sitting here. I want to make sure we talk to Julie, uh, not let this go. So the question is, what's the average time needed in advance to book a shorter caravan? Uh, not one month long, like one to three weeks. So actually, Julie, John Becker is our chair of our um, caravan, International Caravan Committee, and he could answer that better than I could. But I can tell you our current uh, caravan leaders, typically they are planning a year, if not two years in advance. Um, just not for, it's primarily for logistics, as we mentioned earlier on the call, trying to get reservations at campgrounds and things of that nature. It's just uh, a challenge. So I know it's, it's typically longer, um, but John Becker would be the great one to reach out to, to help answer that question even more. Thanks. The other thing to keep in mind, I know this is not what you're referring to, but typically before a large event like an international rally or maybe a region rally, local clubs often have short caravans to that location. We probably had 20 caravans, if not more, local clubs put on uh, coming to Wyoming um, from as far as way as well, Florida, frankly. Um, and that's another opportunity. I know we've done it in our region. Um, they're not probably what you're talking about, but they're really fun, I got to say. I've led a couple of those, they're really fun. So I want to be mindful of y'all's time. Um, we're going to end in four minutes, thereabouts, we'll hang around. I will say something that I was surprised hasn't come up. Um, we're not ready to talk about it fully yet, um, but if you're in Jackson Center or you're around, you'll probably hear that uh, we, we acquired a, a new office building um, in Jackson Center. Um, it was part of a closed session discussion at our Board of Trustees. The building that Lori is in in the daytime, uh, it was donated to the club back in 1980 and built 1980 by a club member. It's pretty much falling apart. We've outgrown it. Um, the board looked at the cost of basically renovating it, putting a new roof on, and with a building that old, it's like, it's not worth it. And so we had this once in a while opportunity where the adjacent property to Jack to where the office is came up for sale. It was a, a dentist office and a bank. And so we acquired that one. It's right next to ours. But the cool thing is, so Lori staff is gonna move there over the next couple of months. But the cool thing is that um, we're gonna be able to offer some boondocking parking in Jackson Center, um, finally, and maybe some hookups also. So we're working on some plans to expand that. I know a lot of people on the West Coast say, well, who cares, right? Well, there's a lot of people who go through Jackson Center. They go for service, they're on their way somewhere else, things like that. So we're really quite excited. We'll be talking more about that um, soon. Uh, but we're really glad we were able to buy that property next door. We got some plans for the prior place to make it into a clubhouse for members who were visiting. Because we have members come in. If you've ever been in Jackson Center and your Airstream is there for service, you kind of wait in a service center, like an automobile service center all day. Or you try to tour Jackson Center, which takes you 10 minutes. And so the idea is to build a place, a clubhouse, um, a purpose-built clubhouse where the old office was for our members to enjoy when they're in Jackson Center, visiting the Heritage Center or whatever, and use it for some rental income too. So more on that later, but it's pretty excited. All right, any last minute questions? Y'all are a quiet group from the from the, the first one, by the way. Because it's late. No, sorry. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know, not for most you out, out west. Well, this has been great. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, thank you all for your for your time. Just so, so we, this is a trial for us. In the first one, we had how many people joined in the first call? We had 135 on the first call. Yeah. We've had about so, 55 on this one. 55, yeah. So it's been yeah. fun. I uh, really enjoy uh, talking with all of you. Um, hopefully see you down the road someplace soon. Uh, Laverne and I are going to be heading out to Arkansas um, for the solar eclipse. Um, by the way, uh, if you're in the path of the totality, which goes from Texas up to the um, 
bumping out the uh, northeastern corner of the United States. There's a whole bunch of our clubs that are putting on uh, solar eclipse rallies. Uh, Intac in North Texas is one. Arkansas is doing some. They're doing one kind of down where Lori lives, Region 4 over there. Uh, it's going to be pretty, pretty fun. As I understand, if you've never seen a total solar eclipse, this may be one of the last ones in some of our lifetimes to see in the United States. So it um, uh, should be pretty cool. So I'll bring on the party. So, okay, yeah. a couple of questions. Um, and y'all can jump off, but we'll stay asking some more questions. Linda asked, what is a caravan? Oh, Jay and Elna. Hello there. Speaking of caravans, <laughs> he's the yes. godfather of caravans. So, um, Linda, what it, what a caravan is, is basically, again, it's a volunteer led trip. It's a, they, uh, the, and our caravan leaders will pre pre plan this trip. It's normally a couple weeks from two weeks to six weeks. Um, they plan, um, the routes, they plan the, um, uh, where you're camping at, they organize all that. They plan tours, they plan all kinds of things during this trip. This is the short version there's so much to this and I appreciate our volunteers that do that. So basically you pay an X dollar amount and it's what we call a kitty fee. And then um, y'all go do your fun. And then um, that's about it. So it's basically uh, support of a uh, free tour guide is, is built into um, the club. It's other volunteers leading that. So there's much more on our website in regards to caravans, but it's definitely one of our biggest assets. Um, and we just need more volunteers at that. So we're working and, on that. And ironically, some of you know this, some may not. Our formal official name is WBCCI, which stands for Wally Byam Caravan Club International. And our club kind of started with these historical caravans that Wally Byam and his team and, yep. you know, would put on. It's a big part of our history. And, and frankly, some of our members, they don't go to too many local events. They're in our club to enjoy the caravans. They're supposed to be quite amazing. But yes. to my point earlier, we have to have shorter caravans. Yeah. And that is something we're working on. Um, and we have to have more longer caravans. So, yeah, awesome. we'll work on it. That's for sure. Hi, Jennifer Dice. Oh, my buddy. From <laughs> <Big Black. Yeah. laughs> Have we considered paying caravan layers out of a kitty fund? Um, so, there's so they're not paid, but some of their spots and stuff are comped. Um, and that is them working with like the, um, campgrounds and things of that nature. So they do, uh, it's, it's not a paycheck, but they definitely get a few, few little perks for taking on the big responsibility. Okay. We're going to sign off and let uh, Ms. Plumber go to bed. She has a big meeting tomorrow. We have a board of trustees <laughs> meeting tomorrow, which I've promised to hold the two hours, right? So thank right. you all for joining Two us. hours tomorrow. That's it. Uh, <laughs> it's really enjoyable. And hope to see you guys on the road. This is not quite the same, of course, but uh, but we really enjoy it. And thank you for your time. All right. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.